Good afternoon and welcome to our Iowa Psychology Program webinar, Managing Millennials in the Workplace. Our presenter today is Dr. Elliot Lassen, a faculty member in our Iowa Psychology Program. Dr. Lassen is the Executive Director of JobLink Maryland, a nonprofit organization which supports the employment objective of the Baltimore Jewish community. Dr. Lassen is also a UMBC alumnus. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lassen. And Dr. Lassen, right now I'm going to make you presenter so you can go ahead and get started. Okay, good afternoon everybody. I hope that everyone can hear me clearly and see the screen. And uh, thank you for participating in today's uh, webinar. I want to thank Ashley Waters from the program for taking care of all the logistics here today. As you can see, uh, I have a couple of hats that I wear being the executive director of a nonprofit organization assisting people with employment, but I've also been privileged to teach at the Shady Grove campus in the IO Masters program uh, for several years now. And in addition to the conventional classroom activities for our students, the program's faculty has tried to support students in other ways, such as providing job leads and mentoring them in their current and future job searches for either internships or permanent positions. Today's topic is managing millennials in the uh, workplace. I uh, just want to make sure that my screen is showing. Can everybody see my screen now? Okay, very good. So today's topic, as you can see on the screen, managing millennials in the workplace. And in many respects, the emerging generation in the workplace has been something which I've been thinking about for some time in working not only with uh, clients at JobLink, but also in counseling students. Uh, recently, I've been exposed to some treatment on this topic of managing millennials. And the treatment has been from academic circles, business literature, as well as within pop culture. The topic of millennials in the workplace and in society brings with it a whole lot of baggage on practical and philosophical levels. Today in this webinar, in the time we have to, together, I hope to share with you some thoughts, observations, and suggestions. And as you saw from the opening slides, uh, there, the, the slides from the webinar will be available as well as the presentation being recorded. So kind of to get us uh, started here today, let me just show a quick clip. And uh, I'll just entitle the clip, uh, You Know What I Mean. I'm not a morning person. I think I'm going to text my boss and tell him I quit. Sorry, what? Where's my promotion? Would it kill my boss to say thank you? Seriously? Courtney, here's the report you asked for. You're welcome. Oh, hold on, my mom's second. Of course I'm qualified. I was class president. What do you mean Wikipedia isn't a reliable source? You want me to go to the post office? Wouldn't it be faster if I just emailed it? Where's my promotion? They should make an app for that. I am such a good multitasker. I think there's an app for that. I don't know why, but my boss thinks I'm addicted to my cell phone. Wait, what? Do they still make fax machines? Why would I read the newspaper? I can get all my news on Twitter. There's no smiley face on this email. I just played an 87-point word against my mom in words with friends. Yes. That doesn't seem fair. He was, like, older, like 40-something. Seriously? I could use some Starbucks. I'll just chat with my manager. Uh, let me Google it. We'll just run it by our manager and then move forward. I Googled it. It's totally legit. Oh my god, I'm tweeting that. I miss college. Now, do you think it should be five pages or six pages? Is Helvetica font okay? Do I need a title page? Do you want it double or single spaced? Why don't they just tell me exactly what they want me to do? Life was so much easier with the syllabus. Work-life balance is just so important to me. I cannot sit at a desk past by the bug. 
is it time for a promotion yet? I mean, I graduated with honors, so I'm so glad I made copies all day today. Can we go back to college? We should definitely go to happy hour. Tweet that. Wait. What? Are flip-flops business casual? What? Is this a team project, or...? This is Allison. Is that a group project? What? I think it's time for happy hour. What? I mean, I've been working at this place forever. It's been like six months. What'd you say? Life was so much easier in college. Do you still get snow days at work? Hey, so the attire for this says business casual. It's like my jeans, right? Is it time for happy hour yet? Things business casual? I need a vacation. Seriously? It's five o'clock. I'm out of here. Wait, I can't do this right now. <laughs> So uh, that uh, fictitious character in the video clip might, uh, might seem familiar to many of you out there. Uh, so let's get started. In the time that we have remaining, I'd like to accomplish a few things here. Number one is to go through the different groups which exist in the workplace today, uh, as well as in society in general, to talk about what buttons uh, can be pressed with regard to millennials. Uh, the third is, should they be treated differently or the same by other cohorts? And also maybe talk about what the future bodes uh, in, this whole, in this whole topic. By way of some administrative points, just to uh, put it out there, uh, they're gonna be, there's going to be time at the end for Q&A. Uh, and since I'm facilitating solo, uh, that might be a better game plan than uh, looking than putting questions into the uh, question box, but certainly if you have a question on point, uh, try to chime in virtually. Uh, furthermore, at a few points during the webinar, I will be asking for your, your input through a uh, poll, uh, so please uh, jot down the URL that you see on the screen, on the, on the screen right now, uh, that will be used to enter in your responses. It's kind of a live uh, polling app that I use, and uh, you should probably open a new tab in your browser when you do that so that you can multitask with the window containing this presentation. Okay. First, let's explore some of the features uh, which are different in today's workplace in, of 2014, and it's probably been the case for the past several years now. I think that we can all agree that the workplace is not your father's Oldsmobile, uh, as the commercial went. Diversity is here to stay, and we could talk about the different factors which make people different uh, from one another, which include, as you can see, uh, multiculturalism that includes race, race ethnicity, uh, place of origin, uh, gender diversity, religious groups coming into the workplace, uh, those with uh, disabilities, uh, different sexual orientations, socioeconomic status, as well as what we're going to be focusing here today uh, on different generational cohorts. To set the stage for our discussion, I put up on this slide the four generational cohorts that exist, and the exact beginning and ending years for each cohort is really a matter of some discussion. And please note that these groups are not totally distinct from one another. There are some who cross over two cohorts. Some people have called them cuspers. They're on the cusp of one into the other. More on what makes these generations different in a moment, but let's look at some of the factors which are responsible for the more pronounced generational differences. Uh, first, uh, one observation is that people are living longer, uh, and also people are working longer, staying in the workforce longer, perhaps out of economic necessity. Uh, there's greater diversity than ever before. Uh, 
there is uh, technology and change. Uh, to me, this is probably the biggest factor of all. Change has been pronounced, uh, and the cycles of change have been very rapid. Uh, we also live in a disposable society, furthering, uh, it, further accentuating differences in uh, values. And as we will see uh, in the coming slides, communication has become more rapid and imprecise. Uh, gratification needs to be instant. Everyone is connected, and messages and data can be transmitted instantly regard, regardless of geography, which has really set out uh, a uh, group of expectations for that immediacy of communication. Some other observations are that people are more spread out and transient than ever before. As such, we don't have the multiple generations of a given family living in the same place but we do have it in the, work, in the workplace. Uh, part of understanding the millennial generation is really understanding the different cohorts. And as we will see, if there's sort of a linear progression here. Some of it is a function of uh, the values of the generations, and some might be a function of age. Uh, it remains to be seen how much of a factor age will be impacting the younger cohorts as they uh, get older. Uh, I'm not going to say that I know everything about this. Uh, the truth is that what we do know today is somewhat of a moving target. While the millennials is the focus of today's presentation, who knows what the future generation will be called and how they might differ from millennials. So as you can see, I, I'm not going to read the slide verbatim uh, in the interest of time, but you can see the four generational cohorts, the traditionalists, baby boomers, Gen Xers, and millennials, and the years uh, that they uh, came into this world. I'd like to call for the first poll, and this will give me a sense of who's out there in the audience here today. I see that there's 17 people that are logged in. So if you can take a moment to either uh, text on your phone uh, a code to number 37607 with whatever you are, uh, and uh, where you can use the uh, pollev.com uh, to indicate your response. Okay, so it seems like we are more heavily skewed towards the millennial generation, which is fine, but we do have some representation from, uh, from other cohorts as well. So I'm glad to see that this, poll, uh, that this poll worked, and perhaps that's a function of many of the people out there being millennials and proficient with the, uh, with the technology. So that did not go unnoticed. All right. There we go. Okay. So each generation, as we will see, will have, in, in the way that I formulated it, will have things that, that uh, kind of are markers, what the, cultural, uh, what the cultural milieu was at that time and some of the, and some of the values that, that they had. And traditionalists, also known as the silent generation, uh, given the fact that many of the people here are of the millennials, uh, I would probably say that these might be your grandparents uh, or even great-grandparents. And the generational uh, environment at that time was, was informed by some significant events in American history, uh, namely World War II, uh, the Great Depression, uh, and racial segregation. And really that was the beginning of some quite primitive technology that we all kind of uh, see in the Smithsonian. Uh, the the uh, television uh, came into being then uh, as they were growing up, and the telephone became more popular. And some of the uh, values that the traditionalists experienced, uh, which might make it very different than the 
millennial generation is kind of a respect for authority. There was a certain loyalty towards one's employer and a mantra of living to work as opposed to working to live. Uh, Work-life balance was really not part of their vernacular uh, growing up. And we see uh, a certain conformity. There was a there was a, a delayed gratification as opposed to the instant gratification that we're going to see. Uh, we're going to see with uh, with millennials. Okay. It's interesting that one of the sources which I looked at in preparing this was was published in 2003, and that was about 11 years ago, when traditionalists were more represented in the workplace and in society. And uh, it's kind of rare to see a traditionalist still working in the workplace, but I think their values still are important to understand in comparing them to the other generational cohorts. As we can see moving on, the next generation that came onto the scene uh, were the baby boomers. And uh, these individuals were born after World War II, hence the name Baby Boomers, and they uh, were born up until about 1964, so there was a 20-year period from the end of World War II until the mid-60s, and some of the things that happened during the mid-60s included the Vietnam War, uh, civil rights movement, uh, and uh, one of the pieces of legislation that we deal a lot uh, with in IO psychology and employment situations is the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which just had its 50th, uh, 50th anniversary. And baby boomers tended to be exposed to traditional nuclear families, and television became a big influence on their peer group. The post-World War II generation, epitomized by the baby boomers, there was a certain security, a certain physical security, as well as economic security that existed in this, uh, in this country, and that left room for things like exploration and protest. World War II was over, there was uh, the Cold War, a bit of uh, distant danger, but certainly not uh, a, a, uh, a, direct, uh, a direct danger to this country, and I think that that informed that generation. And in the workplace, there was a certain optimism, and people tended to look for things like gratification, economic security, uh, health and wellness, uh, and uh, there was a certain comfort with work, uh, and workaholics, that term probably uh, came, came about to describe people that were baby boomers that were entering the workplace. The next generation, bringing us into Gen Xers, which uh, represented some of the people on this, on this webinar, the Gen Xers were born in an era where the, uh, was the uh, post-Civil Rights Act, uh, there was the advent of certain uh, things like MTV, and the mass media because it was coming through different channels, different, literally different channels of TV, but also, uh, also radio, and people started to exchange information uh, virtually through computer, through, uh, through email, as Gen Xers were coming into the workforce. And this is where we saw a bit of a push to what we know now as work-life balance or work-family uh, work-family balance. There was a motivation to be self-reliant, to be independent, uh, in order to carve out time, carve out free time for things that were pleasurable and fun. And this was really the first technologically connected generation. In the workplace, this was the beginning of a multiculturalist and diverse generation in the workplace, 
and the world had started to become a smaller place. And there was a certain global thinking about the workplace. And as we see in the end, technology uh, started, to play a, started to play a role. Some other factors. The workplace could, could be fun in addition to formal. And we see that, we saw that, and we continue to see that in terms of the attire. Uh, kind of the business casual uh, became, became more popular. It's, it obviously exists in greater percentages now than before. And there was a tendency to use pragmatic approaches to problems at work and other areas of life. And we see it more accentuated in the millennial generation, but there's an answer for everything. There's a solution to every problem. It just needs to be researched or, or figured out. That brings us to the millennial generation. And each generation, there's some uh, dispute as to how to call them. Uh, as opposed to Gen Xers, we see the millennials sometimes refer to Generation Y or Nexters or Generation Next. And they make up, uh, you make up about 30% of the population, which is in greater number, greater percentage than the baby uh, boomers. And as I mentioned from the outset, really, uh, technology is what separates the millennial generation from uh, from the previous generation, from the pre previous generational cohorts, but some of the things that we are also seeing is we're also seeing uh, millennials coming from non-traditional families, non-traditional in many ways, whether it's single-parent homes or uh, other non-traditional or non-nuclear families that existed in previous in previous generations, and there's a certain disconnect uh, that millennials have with previous generations because millennials have been nurtured in a very different, uh, very different reality. Uh, much of the millennial mindset is about here, the here and now. And I'm not necessarily saying that's, a, that's a, a, a negative thing per se. But what I will point out is that there might be a little bit of a, uh, a disconnect between historical events uh, that occurred that seem to be ancient history, just because our news cycles and what we consider relevant to us has such a, a rapid pace. The cycle of information is, is very important. And uh, the, as, uh, as mentioned on the slide, you can even see, uh, I, I put up uh, AIDS, for example. So there have been many uh, different health concerns over the years. So AIDS was one that was uh, in place uh, maybe about 10, uh, 10 to 15 years ago, but uh, yes, yesterday's AIDS is today's Ebola, and uh, you know sometimes these uh, uh, the terminology even has to be modified from presentation to presentation. But uh, believe it or not, there was a period of time when people did uh, prepare food in regular ovens as opposed to uh, microwaves, and now VCRs have been replaced by DVRs and TiVo and all these other digital uh, digital technologies. So we can see here in the uh, in, this, in the current slide uh, the information that we access is very much focused on the internet as the platform. In fact, the information that is being disseminated through this webinar is an internet platform. Uh, but we see that there's a relationship with technology as a social medium. And social media, it goes without saying, is very prominent in our lives. And it doesn't just apply to the millennials. It applies to the Gen Xers uh, and baby boomers as well who are trying to stay connected on platforms such as Facebook, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, which is something that I use quite a bit of professionally. And that is, uh, th that I believe is, is a game changer. Technology and social media has really been a, uh, has really been a, uh, a game changer. Okay. All right. This brings us up to our 
second poll. Are any of your kids or employees millennials? So please take the opportunity to either respond yes or no, either through a text or through this URL. Okay, it was kind of a double barrel question, uh, just looking at it and in light of who we have on the, uh, on the webinar here today. Are any of your kids or employees millennials? Uh, so, uh, well, you know, there might be people that uh, don't, have, uh, don't have kids or millennials, but or that the, the employees might, might be millennials. So we have a, a more of a skew towards, uh, towards the yes response there. And uh, you, know, uh, from, you know from where I speak. Okay. Trying to just keep it as interactive as possible. In the workplace, to take a look at, and you can probably appreciate for all those millennials out here, uh, there's a, maybe a certain optimism about the future. Perhaps that should be moderated in terms of, uh, in terms of the employment situation here today. But uh, overall, there's a generally optimistic uh, opinion about the future, and one of the areas that I have observed, and perhaps this is through uh, my own children's experiences, is really the opportunities that they've been afforded to be involved in communal endeavors on a, uh, on a local level as well as an international level, uh, with uh, social media driving the way that information is passed along, uh, social justice uh, initiatives have really captured the attention of the millennial generation. And there are many opportunities to travel, uh, travel the country, travel the world, even be involved locally in making the world a better place. And uh, I believe that uh, that has given the millennials uh, some experiences uh, in leadership uh, that I think is, has been very positive. And there is, uh, uh, there, there, are, there is a value to, of, of achievement uh, that we also see. And uh, you know, maybe uh, there is a, uh, a competitiveness that, uh, that people will have uh, for even things that don't require, uh, that don't require competition. OK. Uh, in conjunction with the social justice that I mentioned, uh, there are uh, there's, a, there's an effort to take strong stands on social issues, issues of morality, and there's a way to follow that, and there's a way to try to make a difference through petitions, through online campaigns and social media. And as we can see, there's a greater appreciation of diversity because it has become the reality of the millennial, the millennial generation. So this brings us to our next poll. I see we have 19 people on, on, the, uh, on the chat, on the uh, webinar right now, so I hope that everybody will chime in. The question here of this poll is, what are your biggest challenges or concerns about the millennial generation? So here it's, uh, you can kind of text your message, after, you can first text in the number at 37607, and then you put in your, the appropriate, the, uh, the, the number 605143 space, and then what some of your concerns or challenges are. Lack of professionalism. Very good. Communicating expectations. Just as a plug, uh, at the Career Center, uh, over the past couple of years, I've developed a workshop on professionalism in the workplace, which I give uh, once a year, usually in the spring, in conjunction with the Shady Grove Career Center. So that's obviously a topic that has uh, been very prominent. Overcoming the stigma. Okay, that seems to be echoed by a couple of folks out there. Understanding performance feedback, thank you. 
assumptions about the millennial generation. Thank you for that. Okay, so we're going to move uh, move forward just really in the interest of time, and I think that uh, you captured what I have on this next slide. The top three things that we tend to see with millennials relate to communication and the way in which millennials prefer to communicate is through mobile media, mobile devices and uh, texting sometimes has an upper limit of 140 characters uh, social media platforms like Twitter uh, has it as well. When I use LinkedIn, I also interface with Twitter and I make sure that my communication maxes out at 140 characters. With the shorter communication and the speed with which we are communicating through these media, uh, there has been an imprecision uh, and that comes through in uh, typographical mistakes and other errors, even with spell checkers and correctors, autocorrectors that we have, uh, there still is imprecision. There's a preference towards digital rather than human communication, and uh, I, I noticed this in communicating with my kids when they use the verb talk. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean talk directly through old-fashioned conversation. Uh, there's also a preference when you need to send a message to somebody, even if they are very close to you in proximity, in physical proximity, instead of going over to the person's cubicle and asking them something, it's often thought of as more efficient to text or maybe even send, uh, send an email or, or Twitter. And I think if you, uh, if you follow sports, I, I often will use the sports world as a bit of a metaphor. Uh, one of the things that you read about with sports and also other entertainment celebrities in that they communicate with the general public and with each other over very public channels, over very uh, open channels uh, that they're kind of putting out uh, their thoughts and their opinions uh, for all to see. And uh, I'm not necessarily taking a strong opinion on that, uh, but that is just a reality. I mentioned before, uh, maybe a more casual workplace, uh, and that we've seen through business casual as well as casual casual, and uh, sometimes there's a bit of a TMI if you, uh, if you know what I mean. Uh, and in terms of expressing oneself through body art, through tattoos and piercings, uh, that is also uh, something that has characterized the millennial uh, generation to some extent. And finally, uh, I, I, I observed just in my own professional life, uh, and I ask my class this question very often, and that is, what is the maximum amount of time that you could see yourself working for a, an individual employer? And interestingly, uh, the window of time that they are giving is about three to five years. And I guess why I find that interesting is that I've worked in, I've worked in context in the past where working for the uh, state government, the state of Maryland, uh, there was, and even for the federal government, there's a certain value in working for a single employer for 20 or 30 years, uh, and that's the way the compensation systems have been backloaded. Uh, but that is really not in sync with the trajectory of the millennial generation. I think also the transiency of where people live, where people are willing to live, uh, and the way that they live their lives. Uh, being in different places is really conducive to that. What some people refer to as job hopping, but that has a negative connotation associated with it. But you kind of know what I mean, and you look at people's resumes and you see three to five years here, three to five years there, 
And uh, I believe that the other generations are going to have to get accustomed to that. It, it's not necessarily a negative uh, associated with that individual, but that's just the reality of today's workplace. There was a study by Levitt and Lucina a few years ago, and it compared uh, managers who probably were Gen Xers or perhaps baby boomers to the millennial generation as to the factors of what generations think are important. And this should give you a sense of what makes millennials tick as opposed to some of the other generations. As you can see, responsibility was not as important. Uh, a sense of accomplishment was more important than previous generations. The actual compensation not as important as the previous generations who want that stability. But here we see a real difference in meaningful work in that th there's a, a certain here and now that millennials would like to experience. They would like to experience meaningful work uh, for the community, for society, uh, here and now as opposed to delaying that gratification uh, towards the end. So I, I, I believe that that is really a significant difference that drives uh, the attitudes of millennials in the workplace. So another video clip that I'd like to share with you. I'm going to uh, show most of this video clip, but not the entire, uh, the entire part. Indonesia for Habitat for Humanity. They know very little about the cultural world, how it operates. When we talk about the millennials, we're talking about a generation born somewhere between 1980 and the year 2000. There are about 76 million of them in the U.S. population today, and that number is still growing due to immigration. And they can be defined in several different ways. One, confident. They've been raised by parents who believed in the importance of self-esteem, and they worked hard to build the confidence of their millennial offspring. They're also a hopeful generation, very optimistic about what they can accomplish, but at the same time, quite practical. They know how to get things done. They're goal and achievement oriented. Many millennials arrive on that first day on the job, and guess what? They've got a piece of paper with their goals already written down. They're ready to go. Where do you see yourself in three years? Well. I figure I'll be in my current position a couple of months, and then um, I'd like to do senior sales, you know, for a couple of years, and then I uh, figure I'll be management, like you. A typical company is likely to have now the millennials. Well, yes, they're well-educated, and they're in demand, and they also know it. You have to remember that this is the generation that had doting parents growing up. Millennials certainly don't mind working hard. It's just that they might expect to get something back when they put in extra hours. So I was thinking I would take off. It's like 8 o'clock, and my friend's band is playing at 9. Tomorrow, I was thinking I would roll in around noon, because I stayed really late tonight. What makes millennials difficult to manage is trying to use our perspectives and our values to do so. In order to recruit millennials, your company really needs to become millennial friendly. For one, remember, millennials are very techno savvy. So you need a company website that's going to make your company and the jobs you offer come alive for the millennials. And remember, millennials are not just looking for a job. They're looking to be involved with a company that has great values, a bigger vision. They need to know how your company is contributing to the world. The position sounds great. I'm just interested in knowing more um, about your involvement with humanitarian issues. And then when you do recruit them, you need to set expectations early on. If your job requires a bunch of grunt work and long hours, don't sugarcoat it. Be honest up front about what's expected. I think 
one of the most important things to know about managing millennials is that they like to work collaboratively. So, can I bounce something off of you? Sure, but uh, this makes it the fourth time this morning. You want to bounce something off? Now, for a Generation X manager who's been used to a lot of independence and being an independent operator, that can prove to be pretty challenging. Can you please have the markups complete by end of business today? Yeah, no problem. I'll get Dave to stop whatever he's doing and help me. I was thinking maybe you could tackle this one on your own. One solution I often suggest is to have your millennials work in teams of two. It takes a little bit of the pressure off that manager to be collaborating all the time, and it helps the millennials encourage each other. Now, we know millennials are also great multitaskers, but they do need guidance. Be very specific about what you want done and by when. And then I'd suggest checking in with them fairly often, even daily, just to see how they're progressing and make sure they're on the right track. They'll not only welcome your input, they'll expect it. One of the big questions on everybody's mind is, once we get millennials in the door, how are we going to retain them? Well, there are a few tips that make a lot of sense for this generation. First, be the leader. This is a generation that's grown up with structure and supervision and with parents who are fantastic role models. So it's not that they don't want to be leaders themselves, it's just that they're looking for some role modeling first so that they know how to get there. Next, keep them challenged. Millennials want learning opportunities. They want to be assigned to projects that they can continually learn from so they feel they're getting ahead. You know, after that we're going to talk about domination of outer space. Third, make it fun. A little bit of humor, a little silliness, even a little irreverence can make your work environment much more attractive for millennials. Respect. Respect millennials for their ideas, for who they are, even though they look young. Treating them respectfully is going to help them feel they have a place with you. Great. And be flexible. The busiest generation ever isn't going to give up all of its activities just because they have a full-time job. With all we've said about how we can work to accommodate the millennial generation, it goes both ways. Millennials also need to respect the structure that already exists in our companies. As a manager, you can help them adapt to the rules and expectations that already exist. You know, I see a lot of potential in you, so I'm going to give you a word of advice. When you email the senior VP, don't start with, hey, you. The truth is, new generations are always going to be entering the workforce, and you will most likely have two or three or even four different generations working together side by side in your company. The key to achieving harmony and ultimately productivity is to understand the perspective of each of those generations. Okay. Just as a, as a, as a shout-out, uh, that uh, video clip featured Lynn, Lynn Lancaster of Bridgeworks, who's really a foremost expert on uh, generational differences in the workplace. Just to accentuate some of her points, uh, I, I, I work with, uh, with students in the classroom uh, and beyond, and one of the aspects that I've tried to really work on is more regular communication. And that could be done through technology like the Blackboard platform that we have, as well as emails uh, that come uh, on a more regular basis, not just about the class, but also uh, between, between classes with other information as well, whether it's job leads, just to keep the students engaged. Uh, one of the points that Lynn made in that clip is something we talk about in psychology, and that is the realistic job preview. And in psychology, the realistic job preview is to put out there many of the aspects that will exist in a particular job, not just the good aspects of the job, but maybe the grunt work that might be associated with it. And that, historically, uh, the research has found that that has reduced, reten that has reduced uh, turnover, and it's increased retention. Uh, another point that she made is to be specific. Uh, millennials really thrive on specific instruction as to how 
act, how deliverables or assignments are to be uh, to be formatted. Uh, many of the many of my students will ask me, well, how many pages? Uh, how many pages should the assignment be? And it's kind of difficult as a as an instructor to give any hard numbers. So I try to give a range and uh, try to put it out there of what my expectations uh, what my expectations are. And uh, finally, uh, I believe that uh, millennials tend to like that scheduling flexibility because the technology has allowed people to work virtually after hours, etc. Uh, some people really thrive on being able to do things at their own pace according to their own schedule and still get the get the job done. So just uh, to kind of give some of the, the, the tips that I've seen for managing millennials, I'll pre present five that I've read and I give it from the Customer Contact Leadership Council that was published a couple, uh, it was published last year actually. And the, some of the, uh, some of the, these tips I've tried to incorporate in my mentorship as well. And the first, of course, is offer uh, career pathing and, and mentoring uh, for, for students as well as for people that you are working with. Let's say if you have somebody that has started under your supervision, to really set out what a potential trajectory would be for that person's job and perhaps that person's career. So mentorship is really, uh, is really critical. Uh, ongoing feedback and recognition. Don't wait until the end of year performance review to give that both positive and negative feedback. Offering that flexibility, job rotations, which gives uh, cross-training, and also to provide that balance of work and play. I think that there's some videos out there on YouTube about what some of the things that go on at companies like Zappos and really trying to infuse fun into the workplace. And here are some of the tips that I have, uh, that I have come up with. And uh, these are the ones that uh, I've, uh, I've collected based on experience, based on, based on my reading. Generations that precede the millennial generation have to really be flexible and st in order to stay relevant. Uh, there, I have uh, some relatives that uh, are a little older than me that just refuse to text. Well, that's not going to keep you in communication with subsequent generations. So staying relevant, especially as it comes with technology and being connected through some of the more latest devices and technologies, whether it's tablets or uh, laptops uh, and the like, really to stay connected both in terms of hardware as well as in social media and, and some, of the some of the things that are trending in society. And uh, we have to expand our nomenclature to include words that have come up uh, recently, such as uh, texting, talking, uh, with somebody that's really not talking, who a friend is. Doing these things will earn the non-millennial a certain credibility. Because if you're talking the same language, if you can appreciate the same language, uh, while at the same time providing that nurturing and mentorship, that is, uh, that is really something that's going to make you more credible. Uh, but here, I think, is, is really what's, uh, what, what's the biggest challenge, and that is to stay balanced. There are aspects of work and work habits and styles that non-millennials have that I believe are, are, are good, and I think that there is a certain, uh, a certain value to that, but you have to balance sticking to one's values, let's say, for example, uh, a certain standard of writing, a certain standard of uh, perfection in, uh, in one's written work. And the tools are out there to do the spell check, to have all of that done, and, uh, but to really to, to stick to your values, but also understanding that there is a changing uh, reality. 
Uh, as mentioned before, try to be specific and literal with instructions. To try to give as much detail as to what the expectations on that deliverable are, uh, assignments, page lengths, formatting, and so forth, I think is uh, what the not, what the non-millennial generation has to be able to communicate. And finally, as you can see at the very bottom, is to give space and set and set boundaries. Uh, in the clip that we just saw, if you are a millennial who is trying to communicate with the CEO or a VP of IT in a company, uh, there's a certain uh, hierarchy that needs to be appreciated, and that with that hierarchy comes a certain communication style of how you address that person, both in person as well as virtually through email, uh, and setting boundaries. Uh, you might not uh, want to send a text to the CEO or uh, even your supervisor after hours. There might be some other channels, more formal channels, through which that should be done and certain time frames when that communication is more acceptable than others. So it's kind of like a, a, a balance and, and meeting halfway to a large extent that we see here. Okay, so I have, um, I have the final poll, which uh, has three responses. Uh, should organizations change to accommodate millennials? Which I, it would be very important to hear from the millennial generation out there. Okay, so I, I see from the responses that came through that uh, it's kind of uh, yes or no. So you're kind of hedging your bets, which I think is important, and I think that's probably uh, the best takeaway from today's webinar. And that is, well, there are certain things that organizations need to adapt, need to be flexible to understand uh, what makes the millennials tick and how to communicate. But as mentioned previously, it's also key to have. Uh, it's also uh, key to have the previous generations articulate and communicate some things that, uh, that and, and I include myself in those generational cohorts, to communicate some of the things that we feel, ha that, that we, feel uh, we, we do pretty well. And uh, by staying current, by staying relevant, that will earn the credibility from the millennial generation to be able to effectively communicate some of our styles and some of our work values to the next generation. So I'd like to leave some time for, uh, for questions. So I will just leave you with this final slide, with, which, uh, which has some uh, further reading. Uh, Lynn, Lynn uh, Lancaster, who is featured in the video clip, in the second video clip, uh, has this uh, book called When Generations Collide that has uh, achieved a lot of uh, notoriety, uh, and uh, there are some other, some other readings. So in the time that we have left, uh, I would like to monitor the question box to see if anybody has any questions uh, with which they could chime in that have not yet been covered. So what's Elliot, on? one of the questions that came through was um, mentioning that a lot of the videos shown have a very female-oriented um, view of millennials. So do you think that male millennials act similarly, or how do you think they differ? I, I think that was just really coincidental, uh, and, and sometimes it makes for uh, maybe a more dramatic presentation. Uh, but I, it's been my observation that to a large extent, uh, male millennials will, will act in pretty, much, in, in pretty much the same way. So my, my selection of video clips was uh, was somewhat uh, was somewhat somewhat coincidental. I, I think it remains an empirical question as to whether uh, whether there whether there are still differences. I, I, I think what what might make uh, the, the, there's been a lot of discussion about uh, about uh, different uh, roles for males and females. Uh, females make up about 50 percent of the workplace, but yet again. Uh, they're also conflicted with uh, potential family responsibilities. And the, the concept of being able to do it all has been something that's been discussed 
very recently on social media. So I think that's a difference between male and female millennials. I, I don't know how much of that will really translates into what we're talking about here today, but uh, I, I do see that there are some, some differences that still are going to always be there. Are there any other? And um, for the millennials that are on the phone, um, what do you think their, um, what steps can they take to alleviate some of the concerns that managers have about millennials? Because I know they mentioned the stigmas and whatnot, so what would you recommend for the millennials on the phone? I would say one of the keys, uh, one, one of the keys is to seek out mentorship. And by being proactive from the very beginning, instead of waiting for a situation to arise, but putting yourself out there to a manager, to a supervisor early on, and really engaging that person from a previous generational cohort to show that I'm here to not just show what I believe I can do well and value that I can add to this organization, but I'm also interested in hearing, in hearing from you uh, as to uh, where my performance is, as to where some of the things that I might do to enhance or to uh, develop my career. Uh, I, I believe that that's probably the, the most, I believe that that's probably the most important uh, step that a millennial can do early on. Uh, and I, I, I observed that with my students as well, students who uh, to engage me early uh, in an academic semester to put themselves out there that they are interested in, like I said, not only doing a good job, but also using it as a developmental opportunity, that creates that bond of mentorship that is, uh, that is so critical. Great. Um, no other questions have come through, so those are the two we had. Um, so thank you very much, Dr. Lawson. Really appreciated the interactive presentation today. The poll was very neat to kind of see who was on the phone. So thank you again very much um, for participating. And thank you to everyone that was on the phone call today. Um, if anyone on online is interested in the IO Psychology program, please note that our application deadline for fall 2015 is March 1st, and we have one more information session coming up on January 22nd, um, and we'd be happy to have you there. And you can find more information um, at umbc.edu backslash IL. Um, and thank you very much. And again, Dr. L uh, Elliot Lawson, thank you so much. You're welcome. It was a pleasure. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Thanks again.